February the 4th, 1986, Julie Strong interviewing Dr. Lonnie Bell at the Carver Museum in Austin, Texas. The topic is Black Enterprise in Early Austin, specifically on the 400 block of East 6th Street, between the years 1890 and 1920. Mr. Mr. Bell is showing me an article that he wrote about black history. It has a lot to do with 6th Street and the entrepreneurs on 6th Street. Tell me what you know about 6th Street in that period, Mr. Bell. Was it a special place for businessmen to be? Yeah, black businessmen. What was so special about it? Well, the doctors, dentists, and all the people, all the blacks who had businesses, most of them, located on the street. Uh -huh. Well, would you say these were the prominent blacks? Yeah, prominent blacks. Uh -huh. So it was a prestigious place to be right. located? Right. Most, most of them were dead. See, that was way back. Okay, Mr. Bell was telling me that he was born here in Austin, Texas, and left in 1935 when he went to Chicago. He returned to Austin 15 years ago, about 1971. After retirement. After retirement. So he was here during the period of our, during our study period. Um, I understand you... There were only 30,000 people in it. What is that? Black and dead, those days. Uh-huh. Only 30,000. But the ethnic group was uh, mostly, they were the majority. That was before this Mexican America started coming across the border. Uh -huh. We were the only ones. I see. So in the 1920s and 30s, you say there were about 30,000. Yeah, 30,000 people. In, uh -huh. And the ethnic group, blacks, outnumbered the Mexican American. Uh -huh. But then they started coming across the border uh -huh. around 1925. Why did they start coming across? What caused that immigration? Do you know? The immigration. Well, I do. I do know too. They didn't have enough rangers down there. So. They didn't have enough what? Rangers. Rangers. Okay. See, here we call them rangers. You uh -huh. know. Sure. Border police. Okay. They were rangers. You know, Texas rangers. They call them. Uh, Mr. Bell, did you know any of these businessmen? You didn't want them. All right, I'm going to I'm gonna go down the list, and I want go you to on, tell I'll me tell about, about everyone. One. All right. <laughs> I want to know about Thomas Delashwa. Thomas Delashwa was a promise. Right. And uh, his mother was school teacher. She taught me. Uh huh. Back, way back, way back in those days, back in the teens, she taught me. Okay. She was an elementary school teacher. Elementary school teacher. Yes. Okay. She taught in South Austin School. Mm -hmm. By the name of the school was Brackenridge. Okay. Elementary school. And do you happen to know where Dr. Delashwa? Dr. Delashwa was in the 400 block. Let's see, yes. One way in the county. 400 block, yes. Uh -huh. um, On the corner, and he had it beautifully decorated with palm trees inside, growing uh -huh. inside. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and he was one of our most prominent men uh -huh. after that one. Well, tell me something more about his his pharmacy besides he had decorated with palm yeah, trees. He had a place where, where customers could go and drink uh, drinks, you know. Uh -huh. Soda pop? Soda pop. Uh -huh. He made all different kinds of uh, drinks, but they, out, they didn't contain alcohol. Uh -huh. Because he had a lot of school customers, college customers coming in there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, so he had a, a soda fountain yeah. in the pharmacy, right? Yeah, that was in the real part of the uh -huh. pharmacy. You could go in there and converse, talk, uh -huh. you know. And you was it a popular place to go? Very, very popular. One of the most popular places on 6th Street at that time. Uh -huh. Now, when would you say that time is? Give me some. That time is 19. 20, okay. 21, on up to the 1930. Okay. Was he located all that period of time? Yeah. Uh, until 1930 at that Somewhere point? Somewhere along in that, yeah. Uh -huh. Do you know when he I left? I don't know the exact time he left. I don't know that. Did he leave before you left Austin? It's so far to think back, let me see. <laughs> I was always involved in post votes and I was really busy fellow there. Uh -huh. Well, think about that. We'll come back to it. 
Tell me more about what his store looked like. Oh, it was beautifully decorated. He had flowers. Fresh no, flowers? I mean, fresh flowers. Uh -huh. yeah, fresh palm trees. Uh -huh. and, uh -huh. and he had so those could grow. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. water and it was just beautiful. Uh -huh. Then he had artificial trees in there, you know. Uh -huh. they, that was the most beautiful place on Sixth six Street, you know. Well, was it common for the businessmen along Sixth Street yeah. to decorate their shops like that? Well, no, 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 not all. He was the one. His was unusual. most spectacular place there on the street. I see. In fact, that was where most of the people went to. When they went, when they went downtown, they wanted to rest uh -huh. after shopping mm -hmm. up and down Sixth Street or shopping on Congress Avenue. They would always come back to his place and go in and rest. Uh -huh. And have a, have a soda, soda, a soda pop, pop or uh -huh. other drinks. He had all types of drinks, but not alcohol, uh -huh. non alcohol, right. non alcoholic drinks. Uh -huh. Was he on the first or the second floor of the first building? Floor. First, first floor. floor. Did he use the second floor for his pharmacy? No, no. no, it was uh, upstairs in the doctor's office. Dr. Givens was upstairs. Okay. Do you think that Dr. Givens and Dr. Dr. Delachois were in business together? No, no. They both own their own business. Okay. Did yeah. one of them own that building? Do you know? By any chance? I think Dr. Givens owned it. I think so. Okay. Well, how was it? I mean, how do you explain the fact that the pharmacist was located? on the first floor and the doctors were upstairs. The doctor was upstairs and then just opposite the doctor was a theater and Dr. Gibbons owned it. You mean across the street? No, same side. Okay, See, downstairs is a big place, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. Dr. Uh, Dr. Delasma uh, was on the corner side. Okay. You see what I mean? Yes. And then next to him was a lyric theater okay. owned by Dr. Gibbons. Okay. Dr. Well, Gibbons owned the Little Theater. Right. And that's where people went to see pictures. See, in those days, there weren't any talking pictures. There were silent pictures. Uh -huh. You understand? Yes. So Dr. Gibbons was one of our most prominent leaders. Right. You see, in those days. You see. Right. So the yeah. Lyric Theater was downstairs next door to Delachois' pharmacy. Yes. Correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Going back towards Congress Avenue. Okay. Good. Yeah. Right now, I want to talk about the Lyric Theater, too, in just a minute. But I want to go back to Dr. Delachois. Do you, yeah, Dr. Do, you, Lashua, I, I do, you, do you happen to know where he was educated? Fisk. That's it. I think Fisk University. Uh, Fisk? Okay. You think that's where he got I his... I think that's where it was. His uh, yes. pharmacy degree? Yeah, I think so. Fisk University. Okay. Do you know if there are any descendants of Dr. Delachois still in town? In the city? In the city? Uh -huh. Dr. Delachois owned a lot of property? Yeah, he owned property. Where yeah. and what? Do you happen to know? Yes, he owned property over, over here on the east side and was that far from his, uh, his home. Uh-huh. His mother built a home there and it's, it's still a show place, an antique place. Is that the Planned Parenthood place? Uh, Planned his place. mother built that home? Yeah. Do you happen to know anything about Dr. Delachois' father? I never did know his father, his mother. His father died way before my time. Uh -huh. Do you know his father's name? No, I can't think of it just right now. Okay. You if, know, you, if, I, if I thought of it, I'd come up there. Could it have been have Thomas? Been. Could it have been Thomas? Thomas, it, no, it was Thomas Delachois. No, I think it could have. No, he would have been a junior, you know. Well, the reason I ask is because I've come across a Thomas Lashwa. I know, but this man's name is Thomas Lashwa. In 1889 and in the 1890s, as a boot and shoemaker on East Sixth Street, and I was just curious to know if it was his father. Don't know. No, I don't know. Okay. 
Because she at the time, I know, the only one living was his mother. Uh-huh. And she was a moat. A Morton? Moat, M-O-T-E-N. M-O-T-E-N, okay. His mother was a moat. What was her first name? I'm trying to think of her first name. I can get it right quick if you cut the thing off. Okay, let's cut it off. So what? Uh, our machine. We're talking about Dr. Delashwa. Uh, can you tell me why you think Dr. Delashwa was so successful? Why his business was so successful? Well, he was very friendly man. He was very friendly. Mm-hmm. And he really was. He was really, really interested in young people. Oh, you know? well, he was. And most of the crowd that gathered around there were more school people and young college people. Uh huh. High school people attending high school. Because in those days, blacks had no other place to go. About six churches. Uh-huh. By him having this fine place, and it was real large for him. Uh-huh. Because he had the whole back was for people to come and rest, you know, and converse, talk, and drink the sodas, you know. Uh-huh. And he had different kinds of drinks that he had invented himself. Oh, really? <laughs> Do you remember any of those drinks? No. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I don't remember some 60 some odd years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, I expect to go home and make one of those drinks. <laughs> yeah, I would too. I, I would still try to make them, but he uh-huh. made them. Uh-huh. Uh, they were real good. Everything he had there was delicious. Uh-huh. Well, how, you said that he was particularly interested in young folks. Young people. How, how, else, how do you know this? I know it because he. Uh-huh. Us because he, his mother was a school teacher. I see. Uh-huh. And by up being a school teacher in Moton, you see, we always would go by her son's place, uh-huh. you see. Uh-huh. And he'd take up with us, you know, and talk, and tell us about his school days, you know, all that bad, you see. Uh-huh. There was always a place to go to the morning, and he was very kind and everything to the young people, and in fact, to all of his customers. Adults and young people. But mostly young people was his clientele that went around there. Uh-huh. Yes. Um, were they, were, was it the young people or the older people who who frequented his, his pharmacy, though, who bought his drugs and that sort of thing? He sort Both. of served. Both. Right. Both. He served the entire black community. Yes, was he uh-huh. the only druggist in town? The only time? druggist in town. Uh-huh. For how long, do you know? Until you left? Uh, well, until I left. And up until. No, we have black workers in there. Back in those days, it was only druggist in town. Mm-hmm. Would you Black consider man. Dr. Delashwa a big man around town? Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Dr. Dr. Delashwa was a big man, so was Dr. Gibbon. Uh-huh. And the L.D. Lyons, I did. Uh-huh. The L.D. Lyons had the only grocery store there. Uh-huh. Where was that? That was down in the 500 block. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought it wasn't in our block, but close by. 500 block. Okay. Yeah, right down the next block. Uh-huh. And it, 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 he had a dance hall up over there. Up over Mr. Lyons did? Lyons. Uh-huh. 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 Did, did Dr. Delashwa do anything with kids? Did he organize any games or did he take them places uh, outside of his professional activity? No, they were back in horse and buggy days, mostly, yes. Do you know? Yeah. You did? Yeah. Do you know of anybody who might? Have you ever heard of anybody who has any objects from Dr. Delashwa's drugstore oh. days, like a sign or a, a glass that the, was used at the soda fountain or drug bottles or any of those, or receipts, photographs? Yeah, I probably do. But she didn't tell me anything of No, no, no. I, I didn't mean for you to bring them. I just will write down any names that you know of. Yes, yeah. Next door to Delashwa's drugstore. 
uh, how long did it stay in existence and what sorts of uh, I'm writing about 15 years, something like that. I'm writing it was at in 35. In the same location? Yeah. Uh -huh. And then the, the 300 block was Lincoln Theater. Okay. Were these the only black theaters in town? Do you know? The only blacks. Two. Just two of them. Uh, well, so this was the era of silent movies. Yes. Are those, is that the only type of entertainment they offered? Yes. Uh-huh. Lincoln, Lincoln Theater was 300 block owned by Lawson, Mr. Lawson. Mr. Lawson. Okay. L -A -W -S -O. Which one of those two theaters was more popular? Both of them. Both were popular. They say for did, did Dr. Gibbons own the Lyric Theater all that time? Yes. Did any special people play there uh, except silent movies? Oh, yeah. Who? They had part of them. Oh, really? They called them part of the people coming from Chicago and New York and different places. Do you remember any of those performers? of entertainments, vaudeville, or individual performers, or silent movies, what could you do there the most often? What what played there the most often of those three Silent shows? movies. Silent movies. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, on special days, they had the vaudeville, uh -huh. there's bands. What, what do you mean special days? On the weekend or special? Weekend. Uh -huh. Every weekend they would have that? Every weekend. No. Every weekend. Uh -huh. Something like that once a month. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Because, you see, in those days, the fact that these big-time performers were coming in to play his theater. Uh -huh. Did you ever see any hand that hand bills? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Have you seen one recently? Do you know if one still exists? No. <laughs> I could I remember something 65 years ago. <laughs> you have a very good memory, Mr. Well, I know. I'm not going to let you forget. I'm going to let you See, the reason I'm asking you about these objects is we're going to do an exhibit in the museum. Oh. Right. So not only do I want information, but I'm also That's all true information. You had to call up the lady and verify. I know, I you know. Understand? I don't doubt this information a bit. Oh, that's I wouldn't have been putting on this. I know. That's great. So I want to tell you. Oh, you bet. I got to uh, tell you what. Sure it's, it's a habit, but I'm trying to get rid of it. But it's still on there. Dr. Gibbons still on the field. Uh, after 1935. Did Dr. Gibbons have a special interest in theater? And yeah, children have the same as Dr. Lashwa. Uh -huh. He always was interested. He was in some politics even back then. Uh -huh. Dr. Dr. Gibbons was. Okay, now, we need to get on to Dr. Gibbons and a whole bunch of other people, but let me do a little thinking right here. I, Mr. Bell, I think that you're such a good resource for me that I'm going to be calling you back with more questions, you if that's all right. Because <laughs> we're not going to be able to cover everything today. I know. Okay. Because he is after 10 now, and I'm going to have to be going very soon. That's right. What time do you want to leave? Uh, I want to leave here about 10.30. Okay. I'm right. later than 10.30. Okay. Um, there was a lady dentist on the 400 block of East 6th Street for a few years. As far as I can tell, she's the first lady dentist I found in Austin and she was black and her name was Sarah Shelton. Have you ever heard of her? Sarah Shelton. I have been. that? I found it in the city directory. She was there between about 1916 and 1920. 
Yeah, well, I should know it. <laughs> you think about it. Remember, I think big girl, I did. Remember that name? Yeah. She's really what important about? to me. She didn't stay in Austin a long time, but she, she didn't. She said it. Couldn't have. No. Uh, I asked how we're going. I know the Dennis here. Yeah, Dr. Hill, I knew it when I was back in the Okay. Day. What about? Dr. Hill was Dennis. I mean, he lived around the corner from the block on the fence. Right. Did yeah. you know Dr. Barlow? Dr. Barlow. Tell yeah. me about Dr. Barlow. I don't know too much about him. Uh-huh. Do you know about how long he was here? He wasn't here too long. He couldn't have been. Uh -huh. I would have known. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, see, I freaked at all those places. Uh -huh. Do you know where his office was? You know anything about him? Anything well, personal? Well, 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 I heard him. Uh-huh. He was a dentist, and that's about all you know. Okay? Dr. Hill was a prominent dentist. Right. Dr. Hill, unfortunately, comes after 1920. Uh -huh. And so he's someone I'm not... I'm not so interested in right now, but I might want to get back to him. Um, let me let me go back to the Lyric Theater. Did only blacks frequent the Lyric Theater, or did any whites go? No. Were they all black performers who? All black. All black. All right. So the blacks. Yeah, this is a segregated city. It still is. Mm -hmm. So you quote me a sentence. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I want those quotes. Yeah. Um, so the Lyric and the Lincoln Theaters. I want to make certain I heard you. The only theaters that the blacks could go to at that time. Lincoln and Lyric. Right. Both theaters. Those days, yeah. Okay. Why <coughs> could black businessmen be located on East 6th Street when it was mostly whites who no, no. Had, had businesses on East 6th Street? Blacks <coughs> all the way to the one block of Congress but mostly blacks. The only white business there between them was Gelb. Government store. They still yeah. have a government store somewhere. I don't know where it is. Okay. So sixty with most of black business. They had one or two furniture stores from you know, white. What kind of stores? Furniture. Furniture, okay. Furniture stores. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. Uh, but you're oh, everybody everybody else down that way. From the two hundred black home. All the way down. All the way down to the 700 block? All the way down there, yeah. I wonder they had a lumber yard down there. I could see the lumber yard uh -huh. located down there. Uh, that, that. that was the only place in town where blacks were located. All other places. Right. Okay. Well, was this place the only place in town where blacks were located? It was not only a place then. It was not only a place where you could shop for groceries and a place where you could get your hair cut. But it was, it was also black, recreation. Black barbershops. Right, right. Back in those days, uh -huh. Mr. Brewer, B-R-E-W-E-R, -E 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 right. he was, he cut white and black hair. Oh, really? He did. Oh. That was unusual, wasn't it? That was unusual. Uh -huh. Why did he but cut white and black? White and black, he did that because he was such a good buck. Uh -huh. He was known all, all over the city. Uh -huh. White cowboys would go there. Cowboys, huh? Yeah, cowboys. We could get by with you. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, where was Brewer's Barbershop? It was located on this. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now, uh, where was the Lincoln Theater? Was it located on East 6th Street? Uh, Lincoln Theater was located on East 6th Street. Yeah. Black barber in town that cut 
They know he must have been good. Like to be the fishing thing. Uh, do you remember what his barbershop looked like? It was a nice place. What, what did it look like? Do you remember any specific images? You call me back later, I'll give it to you. Okay. But I call his daughter. She, Could you give me her name? Uh, Margaret Harris. Margaret Harris. Uh, on Chicago Street. Okay. And uh, Larry Leonard. Do you think that uh, if she would talk to me if I recall that? She would. Tell her I told you. Okay, I will. Yeah, I'd like very much to talk to her. Do you happen totally to, you want to know about her dad? Do you happen to know if the Barbers had any sort of organization in town? No. Any sort of guild or? No, they were no. not organized. Well, no. Okay. Plan to know that it's so good for so bad. But no, we didn't have it. The only organization we had back in those days was lodges. Uh -huh. The Sonic Lodges and uh -huh. different lodges. That was the only organization. Okay. We didn't have any political, outstanding political organization. Oh, you didn't? We couldn't vote. Uh, we had to vote, pay poll tax. I had to pay $1.75 yeah. to vote. Right. Back in those days. Uh -huh. So the, the uh, fraternal organizations were the only ones. Oh, the only ones in the and what service did they perform for people? Were they an important part of the black community? Did yes, they were. The Sonic Lodge was one. Uh -huh. Why were they so important? What functions did they serve? Well, they did go around among the people and try to get them together. Try to get them together? Uh -huh. They tried to cooperate. In fact, they were the only ones that did cooperate. Now, wait a minute. Cooperate with what? What do you mean? With the community. With the community. Uh -huh. So these organizations would try to get a sense of community spirit going and get people well, organized. Right. And yeah. what types of uh, issues did they deal well, with? Well, there were no political issues because see, well, we weren't allowed to. Right. In political issues. Okay. What types of issues did they uh, work on? Uh, education. Uh -huh. Education. Uh -huh. How did they work on education? Well, they, they would try to get the parents to see that Blacks attend the school regularly, uh -huh. uh -huh. and they want them to have a good education. Lodges, nice and pickings. That was a great, that was one of them. For most, I think they don't, they were, they did this out. Uh -huh. you know I mean, they don't have no wrong. Nice and pickings. Okay, and so and they were one of the most important. Yeah. Masonic and Knights of Pitch. Yeah, they were the most important. Yeah. The two most important. That's right. Okay. Um, were there any of these people whom we talked about uh, as, mem as members or as leaders of these organizations? Like Dr. Yearwood? Yeah, Dr. Yearwood was one of them. Colonel L.D. Lyons was one of them. Okay. Last ride, although last uh -huh. Well, so. Would you say then that it was socially, it was socially important and socially prominent, uh, prestigious to be a member of these groups? Yes, they were really prestigious. Uh -huh. Most blacks they tried to join us. Oh, they did. In fact, I always remember the nice uh -huh. And we would go on trips, you know, every year. You know, we'd have special trains. Uh -huh. And we'd go on the train that drill team. Uh -huh. All types of recreation. How did, nice that was only one that how did you get into these organizations? Did they let any black in, or did you have to pass certain? Did you have a friend sponsor you? You had to have somebody sponsor you, uh -huh. and you had to be active. So it was pretty special to get in. It was really special. Uh -huh. But most, most blacks joined the National Pitcher because that was a recreation lodge. Uh -huh. Oh, it was. It was. Drill teams and. All the time, they had all the time. Exactly. All right, how would you say the Knights of Pythias were different from the Masonic Lodge? Was one, you said that the Knights of Pythians were uh, more well, recreational? Masonic was, yeah, Masonic was more. Uh, it stood out as a big lodge, Masonic Lodge. A lot big, right? And the only thing that they, there is was education, which was good. 
This is February the 10th, 1986. This is Julie Strong interviewing Mr. Lonnie Bell on the topic, topic of black entrepreneurs in Austin between 1890 and 1920. This is our second interview. Earlier we were discussing the two fraternal organizations to which blacks belonged in Austin at the time that Mr. Bell remembers, the Masonic Organization and the Knights of Pythias. I wanted to pursue a few more questions about that, those two organizations. Oh, yeah. You mentioned that the Masonic organization you thought was more oriented toward social issues and that they were the only organization that you could remember who tried to organize the block, blacks. Is that right? Do you remember? Well, actually, quite a bit. The nice bit was very good, too. Uh -huh. I told you it was equally as good. Okay. So, Both of them. what other, do you remember any other issues that the Masonic Lodge tried to get blacks to do besides uh, encourage them to get their kids into school. Do you remember any other social issues that they were particularly interested no, in? Political issues, well, most blacks during them days uh, were afraid to bump the bureaucracy just like they are now. Uh -huh. The blacks now, the black leaders here, mostly immigrants, that came in here, they're black leaders. Mm -hmm. They don't push uh, issues for the black. In the black community, in the black community, the most outstanding thing we learn is economic progress. You know what I mean? Jobs. Uh -huh. They don't do that. I'm the only one who had nerve enough to buck, buck the bureaucracy uh -huh. and bring about a change. See? Well, what You'll about notice Jake Pickle, the United States Congress, said I was, you know, yep, I made the city a better place to live in. Uh -huh. And right now, you see, we have uh, at large voting. That means that uh, whites can control our black community. That's no progress, whatever. You see. I stayed with me in nearly 40 years, and I came back and I've been asking for single member districts. But, uh, our black so-called political leaders, I've read that most of them work for the city or the county or the state, and they are spread to speak out. Well, did the, did the Masons Back certain back, political issues back then? Uh, no, they were afraid to, I think. Mm -hmm. Because it wouldn't, do, it wouldn't have been any good then, because, see, that was back in segregation days. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, what? And uh, although Emancipation uh, Proclamation had been where well, 100 years ago, they were still afraid to come forth and speak up, you see. Uh -huh. Well, what, what type of person made a good Mason? Who was allowed to enter this organization? Well, did anybody enter? Or? Anybody with money. They had to have money. Uh -huh. uh, back in those days, it didn't take much money because 
people who go and work, some people work for 50, 50 cents a day. I work for 50 cents a day. You see what I mean? That wasn't much income. So the Masons were more interested in you if you had money and, and they didn't, they not many money. poor folks got in, is that right? No. What about educated? Did they did they let both educated and uneducated yeah. people yeah, in? Yeah, if you progressive, you had to be progressive. What do you, you, what do you mean progressive? Progressive means you had to have some sort of education, you know. Uh-huh. And children dropped out of school then, just like they drop out of school now, you see. Uh-huh. So they didn't and want to... there were a lot of people that didn't have an education. So they didn't want any dropouts? No. Uh-huh. They, they wanted you to stay in school and get education. So they wanted you to stay through uh, high school, or did they encourage you to get into college? Yeah, they encouraged you to get into college. So both, both organizations, both lodges. Uh-huh. The nice of Pittman and the Masonic Lodge, they wanted you to get, get a good education. At the college level? That's college level. Okay. Good, you see. But very few people were able to go to college. Because the people, the parents didn't make much money in those days. You see. Uh-huh. It was, uh, I had to work myself. I had to work day and night sometimes. I had two jobs, you know, to get an education. Uh-huh. It was hard. By the segregation days, it was really rough. Well, did these fraternal organizations prefer certain types of professions, or did they prefer business men and women? They, they, they like business. Well, most of those days, black had to get going to business to make any money because, see, you were segregated from working in white corporations or white businesses. You couldn't, you, only thing you could do would be a janitor uh-huh. or a dishwasher or something like that at a restaurant. Uh-huh. You didn't get no good job. So what you're saying is that segregation really encouraged the black man to get into his own business. To start no, I own. mean the the lodges and the, you know the leaders, the black leaders, you see, because there was no other no other type of work you could do. Uh-huh. Now the only jobs that paid off in those days were uh, being a bus boy in the hotels or uh, 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 being a waiter in the hotel, uh, and that was the only one where they make tips and make, they made more money than school teachers. Uh-huh. School teachers didn't make any money in those days, uh-huh. the amount of money, because uh, what about if, you read, if you read my uh, black uh, history yes, I did. World War I, it told you who made the money. Did the barbers make money? Barbers made money, yeah, they made money. Robbers made money. That, they, that was one business that uh, flourished back in those days. Why did it flourish? Because you had to have a haircut. Uh huh. Going to school or uh, going to church, you had to have a haircut in those days, you know, to look presentable. And most people, even though they didn't have fine clothes, well, they always tried to look presentable. And they were. Well, would you say that barbers were a particularly well-respected profession at that right, time? Right. Why? Well, because they had the most, they had quite a bit of business, you know. Uh-huh. They had quite a business. Haircuts, get a haircut for 25 cents. 25 cents? Yeah, 15 cents for a shave. Uh-huh. See, 40 cents, you could be complete. Uh-huh. What do you mean, complete? <laughs> well, a haircut and a shave. Uh-huh. See what I mean? Uh-huh. And barbers, they made good money. Now, when was uh, Mr. Bill? Mr. Brill was able to build a nice home. Uh-huh. Old man Brill, you see. Uh-huh. John Mason's father. No, that's, that's right. John Mason's father. He was able to build a good home, and he was able to send all of his school, all of his children through college, see. Uh-huh. What else could you get at a barber shop besides a haircut and a shave? Shine. Shoe shine. A shoe shine. That's right. Anything else? Nope. Did you ever shoe see shine. a barber shop associated with a bath? No blacks had that. Why not? I don't guess. No, they didn't have no baths. I don't know. Mm-hmm. How did those baths work? Do you know? One thing, they had uh, wash basins, things like that. Yeah, so uh-huh. you'd wash up after a shave or after, but there was no baths. Okay. Not a black barber shop had a bath. Because uh-huh. that was a little bit too expensive for the barbers. Um, did these fraternal organizations like 
members of certain churches, or did you have to be a member of a church in order to get into a fraternal organization? No, that wasn't necessarily so. That wasn't necessarily so. Uh-huh. Okay, I'm going to turn this off. I'm going to talk about some of these other businessmen whom you remember. We've talked about Delashua. Yeah, we talked about him. And we've already talked about Dr. Gibbons and his Lyric Theater. Uh, who else do you remember down on 6th Street? During the 1920s. We talked about Albert L.D. Lyon, didn't we? We just mentioned him. We mentioned him. Yeah. Uh-huh. He, well, he was, was a big, large man, too. Uh-huh. Uh, and he was a grocer, right? He was a grocer, yeah. But he wasn't a in the local... A lot of people uh, stopped his grocery store because he, he was interested in education, too. Uh-huh. Sent all of his children to college. Uh-huh. They went to school with me. Now, my understanding is that he was not on the 400 block. He was in the 500, 500 block, is that right? That's right. But his driver was still busy. Uh-huh. Sure. Yeah, still busy. See, the majority of six people seven block on back. That's the kind of block uh-huh. on back. On back to East Avenue? East Avenue. Uh-huh. You say that a majority of them were black businessmen, yeah, right? Yeah, black businessmen. How long was Mr. Lyons in business down there? Do you have any For idea? years, I don't really call, recall. For years, did you say? Uh-huh. Okay. I don't know years. What else did he, he do? He was in business past the sure. 40. Past 1940? Um, what else did he do besides run a grocery store? Well, he's a big, large man. He was uh, one of our leaders. If you call political leaders, he was one of them. Uh-huh. And when it was, was like I told you, you know, you couldn't. You couldn't buck the bureaucracies just like they don't do now. Uh-huh. They don't do it now because they're afraid of the jobs. Okay, so he was one of your political leaders then yeah, between so. about when? Oh, from World War I on. On, a, on through the time that you left in yeah, 1935. Yeah. Was, and probably longer. Yeah, longer. Okay, tell me, about, longer tell me about being a political, a black political leader in, in Austin during that period. They're not there you. What'd you do? They, they, uh, the white people thought a whole lot of it. You did like they wanted you to. Uh-huh, I'll bet. They had to be Uncle Tom. Uh-huh. And was Mr. Lyons an Uncle Tom? Not too much. Uh-huh. He just, I don't know, he wasn't. No, he and wasn't. And Gibbon wasn't either. Uh-huh. But the uh, thing about it is, though, they just couldn't say much against the bureaucracy. Uh-huh. The bureaucracy was the government. And, uh, nobody could know that. Well, what did they do for the black community? What did Mr. Lyons or Mr. Gibbons do? They urged education. They urged education? Uh, both of them. How'd they do that? Well, wherever they spoke, they would tell them they had to get an education. Uh-huh. Get a, a college. Job, get a college college education. education. College education. Okay. Did they, um, did they organize their communities for, to vote for certain people? Did they... Yes, in those you? days we paid poll tax. Uh-huh. Dollar seventy five, that's what it cost me. Uh-huh. Did they uh get people to, <coughs> to pay those poll taxes? That's right. Uh-huh. Because if you didn't pay the poll tax, you see, you weren't considered a citizen here. Right. You understand? Right. Okay, how did they uh They what spoke did they? at rallies, churches, schools, you know, colleges. Uh-huh. Two colleges. Students to stay in school, get an education, so that when you did get out of school, you'd get some sort of job. You'd uh-huh. be going to business, uh-huh. as they were. See, they were both two businessmen. Uh-huh. And they encouraged other blacks to get an education. You'd be going to business themselves. Uh, you know, that was the only way to advance it. You see, going to some sort of business. Uh-huh. For yourself, not to work for the white man. No. Well, they didn't say that. Uh-huh. They didn't say that. I know. <laughs> so don't quote me as saying that. <laughs> now, but they knew that the way for the black man to get on was to go into business for himself right, and get an education. Make some, get an education make some money. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But now, to, did either one of these two individuals, um, did they control any votes in the black community? Would you sure did. How so? What do you mean? Well, because, see, they would want to encourage the same as I do now. I encourage the people to vote, you know, and the rest of the vote, you see. And I, 
I have a right, a right of senior citizens to fire him, see, because I registered uh, blacks to vote who had never voted before in their life. Uh-huh. 65 and 70 years old vote now. Did Lyons and Gibbons uh, represent the older folks like you represent them? No, no. What? Mostly with the younger people. Uh-huh. What factions then among the younger people? Well, all of the younger people there is to try to pay the control tax so they could vote uh-huh. and get better better job, even when they started letting the blacks get into jobs, well, they still couldn't vote, didn't have a word, you see. They didn't consider you a citizen in those days if you didn't vote, and if you didn't pay your poll tax. So lines and giving them charges to pay the poll tax. Uh-huh. See, I paid mine, you see. And I had to, I opened up a plumbing shop and I opened up a tailor shop, you see. Oh, you did? When was yeah, that? that was back in the day. Uh-huh. And I was, I plumbed all of them down Congress Avenue and everywhere. See, I grew up in the white neighborhood. Where were your plumbing and barber shops? Uh, I had one on, uh, the plumbing shop was on Rosewood Avenue, and my uh-huh. uh, tailor shop was up on uh, Angelina and 12th Street. Okay, and that was in the 30s? Yeah, 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 and yeah, my, my chef and Concho January, he's passed on now. Uh-huh. See, he worked out at the University of Texas at a fraternity house, and we got all that business, white business. Oh. See, and so I made a lot of money. That's the reason I was able to have own a car with back in the Depression days. Uh-huh. And pay my poll tax so I could vote. So it was through your barbershop that you got the white business at the fraternity house? Yeah. Right? Uh-huh. No, not no barbershop, tailor shop. Taylor, Taylor, excuse me. <laughs> I didn't own no barbers yet. Uh-huh. <laughs> plumbers, you got a plumbing trade. But your friend. I knew I my friend, we both knew how to clean and press clothes, so we opened a business together. Uh-huh. And he, he had worked in the fraternity, is that right? That yeah, was, he worked in the fraternity, and he contacted all the other fraternities out. I got so you. we had a thriving business back in those days. Uh-huh. You understand, we made a lot more money than most other people did, you know. Didn't have it, see, I was in two business. Uh-huh. And what was your friend's name? Concho January. C-O-N-C-H-O. Right. Concho January. January. Just, just like right. January. Okay. January uh, like it is now. Well, if the political climate was so difficult for blacks at the time that Lyons and Gibbons were leaders, what was it like for the blacks? Well, I guess blacks didn't have a better break with the political climate. Well, why did Lyons and Gibbons go into it? Yeah. Because that made them have a better break with politi- white political leaders. I see. Don't you understand? Uh-huh. If they wanted you to vote for them, kind of line them led the blacks, you see. Uh-huh. They could uh, encourage the blacks who, they, who to vote for them. Don't I you understand? You. Yeah, I understand. It's the same way I do now, you see. I uh, encourage the black senior citizens who to vote for them. Because, see, I'm in experience and I know I'm traveling and I know who's segregate who's, who's the segregation and those are not. Uh-huh. I know who's going to treat the blacks the best. And that's all I'm interested in now. Uh-huh. And I'm an old man, but I, I still believe in it. You see what I mean? Yeah, I see. So that was the same process, that both Gibbons and Lyons. Yeah, used, right? yeah, they used it because, see, it benefited them. Yeah, but it also benefited their blacks. It also benefited the blacks because, yeah. see, they could get these done by the white political groups right. to help the black community, you know. Sure. By them going on their side. You uh-huh. understand? Uh-huh. So it was just a trade. Uh-huh. I see, understand. Well, I'll bet this caused some problems, though. With it caused a lot of problems. I bet a lot a of problems with Uncle Tom's. Well, that's true. That's true. Yeah, that's unavoidable. I yeah, well, they call me a controversial guy now, which I am. Yeah. I'm controversial for the truth. You understand? I believe in the truth, and I don't believe in violence. I really don't believe in violence, but I do believe that uh, blacks should have equal opportunities, the same as the white. But we don't have any more political leaders here that believe in that, seemingly. Because I've had to fought all, fight all my battles by myself. Uh-huh. But I did accumulate a lot of things, you know, and I made a better place for white and blacks to come together. Right. You understand? Well, how did Lyons and Gibbons get their training? How did they get interested in this in well, the political arena? They both went to school, college. Uh-huh. They, they, they 
they were, right. Did, were they following anybody who had uh, sort of before trained them? them? Uh-huh. Before them? Uh-huh. I think they probably didn't bother, you know. Uh-huh. But you don't know but of any don't know earlier of, political no, black no, leaders? Back, yeah, well, some of them I heard of, you know, when I was young, I heard of them. Early ones, but then... Uh, you remember their names? No, uh, if you had somebody had told you, you probably would, but yeah. I doubt if anybody in Austin know any more about it than me. Uh-huh. Even people like Ada Simon, she was an immigrant. Uh-huh. They came from Louisiana here. She, and she's a folk slower. She writes books and everything. But whereas the early, early, I'm the only one I know living is doing that reading they told you about me. Mm-hmm. See, I was reading Christ's mother. She contacted me and they read Lewis to him. That's right. To contact me. They knew that I knew. Well, do you know of anybody whom Lyons and Givens particularly? Huh? Do you know of anyone whom Lyons and Givens trained <laughs> to, to be leaders, to be black leaders? Black, black leaders? Uh-huh. Well, they trained me. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> they did? Yeah, they told me what to do and what not to do and all. Who? Which one? Both of them. And the last right. Oh, that last was a leader, too. Uh-huh. But he was a quieter leader than they were. They were the most, they were the supreme leaders, the two supreme leaders. Uh-huh. L.D. Lyons and uh, Dr. Gibbons. For how long did they remain leaders? Until they died. Okay. So that gets us up into the 1960s or 70s? Yeah, that gets you on up there. So no one was as effective as Givens and Lyons That's right. until were, after that period, is that right? That's right. Well, Jay Mason Brewer, he was, he was, that was the, the barbershop's son. Uh-huh. See, he was the same way. He encouraged people to go to school. Uh-huh. And he was a writer, a folk lover. Folk lover. Right. He could tell stories way back farther than I did because he was older than I was. See, but he knew. But you said that Dr. Delashwa was a quieter leader. What do you mean? That, well, what I mean by that was he didn't go out around and visit like a Gibbons and Lashua, I mean Gibbons and Lions and make speech. Uh-huh. See, if it, Gibbons and Lions, they would go to different churches, schools. Mm-hmm. And speak. Okay. And how did Delashwa? He did it by people leadership. coming in his place. I see. Don't you understand? The okay. Students, college students and high school students, they played this place. They, they went in. Okay. You see, and he would talk to you then and tell you what he thought you should do, but he talked to education too. You uh-huh. Do you remember talking to him about these topics? Yeah. Uh-huh. I remember talking to him about segregation. And I remember talking to him about giving about segregation. I didn't like it. I don't like it now. Uh-huh. That's the reason I fight it. And if you read about me, you see. I fight segregation. I'm writing it. I'm doing it right now. Fighting segregation. Okay, so you would Discrimination. say... Discrimination. You would say that the three most important political leaders prior to 1950s or 60s would be Givens, Lyons, and Delashua? Delashua, because he had a chance to contact the younger set. Right. More so than Givens or Lyons. More so. They freaking in his business. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. He had this beautiful drug stove with all that back in the back where he could go and sit down and converse, you know, and talk. Uh-huh. And he would come back and talk with you, you know. And beside making it fit in his prescriptions and selling his medicine. Right. Times, so Gibbons and, and Lyons then, because they were the two with the political leaders. They, yeah, they were big church leaders. Okay, and, and because that's where they made their speeches, they They're had right. closer contact with they, the middle-aged people. Contact. That's right. Uh-huh. They had the most contact. Okay. And they made it. And they did, it did benefit the blacks due to the fact that uh, we had to have somebody speak up for us over here. For the east side over here, for the blacks. Well, the blacks lived all over in those days. Blacks lived in the white neighborhoods and everything. I lived in the white neighborhood. But quite naturally, I had to go to school over here because school was segregated. Right. So I had to come from the west side way over here to school. I had to come from the south side way over here to school. You see, when I lived on the south side. Where did you live on the west and south sides? I, know, I lived on Wood Street in the west side, right next to West Avenue. Wood Street? Uh, that's where I was a teenager. Uh-huh. 
So when did you when did you move away from Wood Street? About. Uh, Well, I was in college, I think I moved. I don't know what that was. 1920s, maybe? Way back in there, yeah. Okay. It was in the 20s. All right. And where is Wood Street next to West Avenue? Where does that intersect? That's west of West Avenue. Next street over. Okay. From West Avenue. So okay. That's the next street over. West Avenue is the street, you know. Then the next street is Wood Street. Okay. Um, what was the, the closest east-west street to Wood Street? <coughs> West was, uh, West Avenue was the closest. Okay, but West That's Avenue goes north south. This way, huh? West Avenue goes north south. What was a cross street? Cross street near Sixth Street. Sixth Street. Okay. Sixth Street. West Sixth. West Sixth. West Sixth. All right. Yeah, it's close. And where did you live then in South Austin? And when? And I lived out uh, in uh, Bart Spring Edition. Okay. Right up on top of the hill, Bart Spring. Okay. And from and what period did you live there? That was when I was small, real small. Did you I lived there during the war, too. During the First World War? First World War, yeah. But I was big enough, you know. Where did you live out. first? Did you live on Wood Street or Barton Springs first? Barton Springs. Barton Springs was your earlier uh, residence. Yeah, but I became a teenager. I moved over to Wood Street in the white neighborhood. That's the most particular white okay. neighborhood. Okay, okay. Uh, and uh, then when up. did you move? When did you move... Uh, from there? Uh-huh. From Wood Street, where did you go? Oh, Adiac Street. Adiac? Adiac. Uh-huh. Adiac. And that's in East Austin? That's East Austin, yeah. And when did Adiac. you move there? About? Uh, it was in the Between 3rd and 4th Street. Between 3rd and 4th. Okay. East side now. All right. Now, how did you have all this contact with these black businessmen on 6th Street during that period? I went around. I had a bicycle. I rode around. You did. Okay. Okay. So you didn't have And then when I got a car, well, I drove around. Okay. So you remember riding up and down East 6th Street on your bicycle. That's right. I remember going to the... To uh, the pitch shows, or the, the Lyric and the Lincoln Theater. Uh -huh. The Lyric Theater was owned by, by Dr. Gibbons, and the right. uh, Lincoln Theater was owned by Mr. Lawson, L A W S O. Right. Um, tell me what six years. And there were silent like? pitches. I'm sorry? Silent so they had. Right. They had, wood, they had bricks, streets with bricks. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, wooden cross old thing. Cross old. Wood creosote. Creosote. Creosote, yeah. They were soaked with creosote and then put out on the streets. Uh-huh, the wood was. Wood, wood blocks. They were uh -huh. wood blocks, brick blocks like. Oh. Made it wood blocks. Uh-huh. Soaked with creosote and then put out. Okay. That was sort of horses and wagons, buckets, because wood sink down in the mud. Uh-huh, uh-huh. There was no paved street. And when was this, Mr. Bell? There was no paved streets on Congress Avenue. Wood, they were wood. Uh -huh. Creosote uh -huh. blocks. Uh -huh. Back in 1920, in the 20s, 23, 24, 20, only so about 30,000 people lived in those days. Uh -huh. So these um, wooden Crisol. blocks that were soaked in creosote. Crisol. 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 You know what yes, 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 I know. You, you can use it for a disinfectant now, uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. uh, these were used to make it easy for the wagons? Wagons to travel over and cars. What cars it did have in those days. Uh -huh. Where were the wagons coming from? Wagons coming from people in the city had wagons. Uh -huh. They had buggies. Uh -huh. Dr. Granberry had a buggy. That's where he made his calls. Uh -huh. And I worked for him. Uh -huh. See, Dr. When Dr. I lived Barry? on Wood Street. Yeah, the Dr. late Dr. Dr. old Dr. Was Barry. he black or white? White. Uh -huh. I was in the white neighborhood. I had to work for him. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> okay. See, and uh, when I was in South Austin, I worked for... Don Berry. Mm -hmm. See, he, uh, he's a judge now. His son is. He's you know, about the same age. Did Dr. Cranberry treat blacks? Yep. He did? Yep. Can you spell his name for me? 
Is it cranberry or grand? Granberry. Grand, G-R-A-N-B-U-R-Y? Yeah, that's okay. it. Okay. Uh, did he treat mostly blacks or mostly whites? Oh, white and black. He treated everybody. Uh-huh. Was that unusual? I don't know. It was not unusual? There were a lot of white doctors treated black. Oh, yeah? Who else? Let's see.
Did well, not after they got to college, you know, they could get around with and that was big days, you know. Right. Did Dr. Yearwood treat white and black uh, patients? <coughs> let me see. You I don't have. think so. He might have. Uh -huh. Because he was probably one of the leading doctors in Austin. Uh-huh. So was uh, Dr. Christian, too. You heard about him, too. Uh-huh. He's a little, I haven't asked you about Dr. Christian because he's a little after my period. Yeah. Do you know yeah, if he, he has, a little after period. Do you have any, do you know if he has any descendants here in town, Dr. Christian? Dr. Christian, yeah. He does? Most of them died, even the young ones died. Howard Christian died. Let's see. Yeah, but he got some here, you'll find uh, Connie can tell you those. Uh, <coughs> okay, what is Dr. Christian's first name? Huh? What was Dr. Christian's first name? <coughs> I can't think of it right now. Okay. Don't come to me. Okay. I'll See, ask I left and stayed away for 35, 40 years. I yeah. stayed away for uh, Connie can tell you. Okay. Connie Haven. Yeah. All right, I want to go back to one more topic. You were telling me some things about what you saw on 6th grade, 6th Street that time when you were riding your bicycle as a youngster. Uh, you said you saw these wooden creosote the, they, they were there. That's right, only, well, they had them on Congress Avenue. Right. Wasn't no pay. Were Congress and Sixth Street? No Street. Were, were Congress and Sixth Street the first had, two streets they, paved like that? Yeah, they, they were paved like the other streets was white chalk or White bridge. chalk, okay. White chalk. So Congress and White East chalk, because they got that from up in Oak Hill, all them down here. Uh -huh. See, that's a rocky part of the country up there. Uh -huh. And they were white rocks. Was it Caliche? And they'd be crushed. Caliche, you mean? No, no. They, they, they were mixed with rock, you see. Uh -huh. And you could sink down on them, though. Uh -huh. okay. well, see, they were put on top of uh, that sorrow. Okay, but what about East 6th and Congress? Were they the first two streets to get these wooden blocks? They had wooden blocks, yeah. And they were the only Sixth ones street. that you know well, of? they had them. 6th Street, uh, the wooden blocks went about. About five or six blocks on the other side, west side. Okay, and how far on the east side? Down to about 500 blocks. So about 10 blocks total? Yeah, 10 blocks total. With crystal, crystal. Well, why was East 6th Street one of the earliest streets paved with those blocks besides Congress? What was so Congress had, they had them all the way to the, to the bridge. Right, but why East 6th Street? Why didn't 5th or 7th or 11th or another street get those blocks? They didn't get them. Why, why East 6th? The city with 30,000 people didn't have much finance. Uh-huh. You understand? Yes. But what was so important about East 6th Street? Why did they pick 6th Street rather than 5th or 7th? I really don't know. Okay. Because that was where the business was. Uh -huh. Wasn't that 7th Street? I had woods and things. Uh-huh. Wasn't populated. Uh-huh. When you were riding your bicycle? Wasn't right? populated, right. Okay. 8th Street, 9th Street, 10th Street, wasn't populated. White Chalk Road, even up there, all the way to the, on each side of the Capitol. Uh -huh. But the wooden blocks went all the way to the Capitol. Okay. Wooden cross over blocks. All right. That's back in 18, 19, and 20. Okay. 19, 18, 19, 19, and 19, 20. Right, in 20, 21, 22. Okay. It all right. Tell me what else you saw on 6th Street. What else did it look like? It was the same as it is now, when some sides didn't have sidewalks. Some of them didn't have sidewalks. Some of the blocks didn't? Yeah, some of the blocks had partial sidewalks. Uh -huh. That's the way it was. Uh -huh. But then they had, between, if the stores didn't put the side seat, but they had, they, those businesses had to pay for them. Oh, so the stores themselves had to get those sidewalks out. They had to get the paper sidewalks, right. Had to help pay for them? Or they, had, they, they mostly paid for them. Lighting. Was there any lighting down there? Yeah. They had, light, they had uh, street lamps, you know what I mean, with the poles. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Poles down there to go up and have a big round and go up like that. Uh -huh. They had them, you see. Okay. And they were mostly at the end of each block. Uh -huh. Sometimes, when it really wasn't business, they had them. Uh, okay. They had pole lights, but they reached about, about 12 or 13 feet high. 
round, they call it like, uh, round. Just a round globe. Round globe. Big. They were large but globes. Large globes. That was only like the head. Okay. And down the middle of the street, streetcar was. Right. You see, but they had the trolleys. Uh -huh. In those days, they didn't have buses and trolleys. They had electric wire belt. They could put them in it. The car got to the end of the road line where they had to get out and turn the trolley all the way around uh -huh. and start it back the other way. Okay. What else did you see on 6th Street? What about the people? I'm not talking necessarily People, they were all the different races. Where were the blacks mostly located? Would you say they were mostly upstairs in offices or mostly downstairs? Upstairs in offices. All the black, black, uh, like doctors, dentists, uh -huh. they're upstairs. But what about the grocers and the barbers Gro and the tailors? Grocers are downstairs. Okay, so... I mean, tailors downstairs, barbers downstairs. Uh-huh. Well, why do the doctors locate upstairs? That, well, that's a hundred dollar question. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> what I'm getting at is <clears throat> were the blacks segregated to the upstairs buildings, and you're telling me no. Blacks on 6th Street, they go anywhere they want. Okay, that's what I want to know. But they'd rather have it upstairs because it was more private for dentists and doctors. Sure. Okay. It's more private, uh -huh. you understand? Uh -huh. That's why they're located upstairs. Uh -huh. If they're located downstairs, it would have been too much traffic. And traffic, traffic. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? So when we went upstairs, they had a sitting room where you sit down until you were called. Uh -huh. See, and that way. They had to have it quiet, you know. Mm -hmm. that, that was the only way because downstairs there was a wagon running over the wooden blocks and made a lot of noise. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You understand? Yes. They had big, big wagons. Uh -huh. Transport wagons. Uh -huh. Five or six, six mules. Uh -huh. Some of them eight mules. Put them. See what I mean? Uh -huh. That was uh, what they were ordering uh, material from stove to stove. They had to, then they had hitching racks all up and down 6th Street. Hitching racks all up and down Congress now. Congress having a hitching rack. All the way to the city bridge. Okay. Well, and uh, hitching racks all the way down to the 600 block on 6th Street. Uh -huh. But on the west side, they didn't have any. Because all of the business, white and black, was congregated on Congress Avenue on 6th Street. And 6th Street, west side only, went the business only went about Oh, and then and it became residential? Became residential. <coughs> right. And wooded, too. Woods, woods, woods. Uh-huh. Black rocks. Not no lots, but just woods. But the street extended on. You know, and then when it ran out of the wooden blocks, it went into that white. So mm -hmm. from up in uh, Oak Hill, they hold it down from Oak Hill. Okay. Crush rock, crush rock. Okay. Crush white rock. White crushed rocks. That's right. That was your street. All downtown, with the exception of six of Congress. Okay. Uh, this is back Were in you World War One, and uh, you know, up in the early twenties. Yeah. Were you ever inside any of these doctors' offices? Yeah. Tell me what they looked like inside. They were very, very clean. Uh huh. Very, uh huh. All of them, very, very clean. And antique divans, antique chairs that you sat in. But were they, they antique at that time? Yeah. They didn't have no modern furniture back in that day. Well, I mean, did they? Was, was the furniture new at that time? Or was oh, it, was it was new, but it yeah. was it was made on antique proportion. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. The arms of the chairs, you know, were antique like, you know, uh -huh. but they were new. Okay. And really nice, clean, all of them. Every office that you went in, doctors, dentists, and whatever, it was nice. Uh -huh. And it was the same way as the drugstore there. Uh -huh. That's why I had the only black drugstore in those. Right. Tell me some more about what those offices looked like besides, you said the furniture. They had rooms, they had everything. Huh? They had everything they got now. It was antique. Did they have a receptionist receiving you who, uh... Yes, most of them had a secretary. Okay. They met you. Met a black you. secretary? Black secretary. Uh -huh. Usually a relative or just anybody? Anybody that was... Three, three that are tight. Uh -huh. But very few typing was done in those days. 
very few. Did the doctors use nurses there in their offices? The, 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 the whoever that was, the receptionist. Oh, I see. The receptionist was both a both secretary and a nurse. Okay. And a combined. Uh -huh. So they usually only had one employee. Yes, that all of them had one. And she acted as a nurse and a receptionist at the same time. Uh -huh. Well, she was in the front of the office. Right. And the doctor was back in his corner. Mm -hmm. See, okay. when you go there, you sign up with the receptionist. Uh -huh. And when the doctor needed help, she had on white. she come back and hit it. So she wore a white uniform? White uniform, all of them. What did the doctor wear? The doctor, he had a white coat. Mm -hmm. He put on a white coat down. So I had aprons. Aprons? White coat. Uh -huh. Did they wear ties? Yep. <coughs> all of them. Mm -hmm. They were back of their dress. Uh -huh. All the doctors and dentists were there. Well, each one of them had a reception. Mm -hmm. The reception always acted as a nurse, too. All right, Mr. Bell, I think I've picked your brain enough today. Might have to call you.